But when the pandemic first started two years ago today, I always imagined that when we came back together, it would be with trumpets and processions and great joy, possibly confetti. We got a little confetti going on outside. <laughs> but after two years of this, um, it looks like it's going to be more of a slow crawl in from the parking lot. But we'll take that. We'll take it. I want to say a couple things here that might sound silly. But when you've been out of practice for a while, sometimes you forget. And so, remember that the bold parts in the bulletin, whether you have your bulletin electronically or a paper copy, you're going to say those aloud in unison. And some of them you won't expect. There's a couple of those in the prayers of the day that you might not expect. Uh, during Holy Communion, uh, Helen and Eileen will pass the Holy Communion out after we bless it. And then they will, bat, um, during the closing canticle, they will pass empty baskets for your empties. So just hold on to your empties until those come around. Um, and oh, the last thing I do want to mention is that where there are readings in your bulletin, uh, they are from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And it may vary a little bit from what you hear because we have taken on reading from a women's lectionary for the whole church by the Reverend Dr. Wilda Gaffney. And her trans, she's a Hebrew scholar um, and a uh, Old Testament professor and professor of Hebrew at Bright uh, Divinity School in Texas. And um, so I just want to alert you that if this sounds a little bit different than what you're looking at, that is why. And I believe that is all. And therefore, I invite those who are able to please stand that we might have a time of confession. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and therefore by his authority, I pronounce unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
I also want to welcome anyone who's watching at home. We're glad you're here, too. Let us pray. Lord, in the first garden, we tried to judge a tree by its fruit, or we judged the fruit by its tree, which you told us to respect from a distance. Forgive our disobedience and accept our thanks for making curiosity the most powerful temptation of all. Help us so to direct our hunger for knowledge that we work fruitfully and humanely within the limits you have set, that your will might be done on earth as it is in heaven. Please be seated. There's a mic. Is it on, Kevin? It's on. A reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Now the serpent had more naked intelligence than any other animal of the field that the sovereign God had made. And it said to the woman, Indeed, did God say you two shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of any tree in the garden we may eat, though of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, God said, You two shall not eat and shall not touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you too will certainly not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you too will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her man, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths. For themselves. Here ends the reading. I don't see any littles. Do we have a little under that blanket? No. Nope. Don't see any littles. All right. Let's have a prayer for our littles. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your goodness that continues to pour forth around the world in the little moments of humanity caring for one another with compassion. We pray for that a vaccine is soon ready for our children who are five and under, that they too might be more free, might be protected from this virus, and might feel safe and comfortable coming into groups like this once again. Thank you for caring for our children. And please help them soon be vaccinated in the same way that we are. Amen. The second reading is from the second chapter of Ephesians. Now God, who is rich in mercy, loving us with great love when we were dead through our trespasses, brought us to life together with Christ. By grace have you all been saved. And God raised us up together with Christ and seated us all together in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus. 
This, that God might show in the ages to come the abundant riches of God's grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace have you all been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not the result of works so that no man may boast. For we are what God has crafted created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our path. Word of God, word of life. To Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 15. Beware of false prophets who will come to you all in sheep's clothing, but inside are rapacious wolves. By their fruits you will know them. Are grapes gathered from thorns or from thistles figs? Thus every good tree bears beautiful fruit but the rotten tree bears wicked fruit. A good tree cannot bear wicked fruit, nor can a corrupt tree bear beautiful fruit. Every tree that does not bear beautiful fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will know them by their fruits. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. with apple trees in our yard for my teenage years. They lined the long driveway from the dirt road up to the old farmhouse we lived in. My father, who had quite a green thumb and a beautiful uh, garden out back that produced very, very good fruit in the way of tomatoes, my father hated these apple trees. He, he said, they're so messy. They drop apples all over the driveway. And indeed, when we were learning to drive, my brother and I remember hearing the crunch of the apples as we drove over them. My love of applesauce is legendary, but based on all the applesauce from that driveway that clung to my boots, I have no idea why I ever go near it again. Trees, fruit trees, are messy. Also, according to today's reading, they're good and bad. Who knew? Who knew? How can you tell a good apple tree from a bad apple tree? Do good apple trees turn bad at some key moment in their life? Can a bad apple tree turn good? And if so, why? Can an apple tree choose to hold on to its apple so it doesn't mess up the driveway and thus be good? Can an apple tree choose to drop an apple at just the right moment to a hungry passerby and thus be good? Do apples invite worms to live in them and give them shelter so they won't be homeless? Is, does an apple tree that has apples with worms in it, are they good or bad trees? Hmm. It's odd to think of fruit trees being good or bad. Therefore, I have concluded this is a parable. You are the fruit trees, that's right. <laughs> you are the fruit trees, and what you produce in this world is the fruit by which people know who you are. And because it is somewhere around 9.45 in the morning, after not doing this for two years, and because we get to welcome this day with daylight savings time. I am just going to cut to the chase now. Okay. Um, it's, we have spent this, we're spending this Lent looking at grief. This week we are looking at grief 
as it shows up in either bargaining or anger. You are the good fruit tree. You are all good fruit trees, okay? We're gonna just get that on the table. You're all good, good fruit trees. And how can I say this so decidedly? Because I have seen the fruit that you bear. I have seen you care for one another in tremendously difficult conditions. I have seen you sacrifice for one another, doing things you don't want to do because darn it, you're a team player and you would really like someone to recognize that. I have seen you make batches of soup, lots of them that you freeze, that we might deliver them in care packages to people in need I have seen you march for justice and fill our little food pantry for years now. No matter the conditions in the world, there is always food in there for those who hunger. I've seen the quilts you make, the beautiful quilts. I watched the uh, memorial service yesterday for Karen Hacker. I had no idea she made that many of our banners, she made this one. I think they said 29. Yeah, so a lot of our banners from Karen. And I know that a group of you gathered to watch Karen's funeral. Why? Because you loved her and you loved Denny. Still, love is something that comes from good trees. Love is very, very good fruit. But sometimes, the fruit that even good trees produces doesn't look so good. Sometimes it looks like anger. Sometimes it even morphs into rage. And sometimes when we are grieving, it happens way out of proportion for the offense at hand. That is how grief manifests as anger. Let me give you an example. One of my colleagues told a story about in his very first call, his very first year, a three-year-old child in his congregation drowned. He went to the family's house, as pastors do in time of trial. He walked in, there were quite a few people gathered, lots of sounds of tears. And before he could even take off his coat, the father of the child stormed towards the pastor, grabbed him by the lapels of his coat, picked him up off his feet, and began to shake him from side to side while screaming in his face, how could your God do this to my baby? That is deep grief that manifests as, as anger. Now, when you hear that story, and then you hear that eventually the father ran out of steam and collapsed into the pastor's arms and wept like a child, you may think, way to go, pastor. Way to go. Way to absorb that grief and not see it as anger that personally threatened you, way to look at what was lost, instead of the fact that you were being shook in front of all these people violently from side to side. And so with that in mind, I want to suggest that we, in order for us to come back together and be this community of faith, that has loved each other for so long, that has loved each other for so long, that we spend some time reflecting on how is our grief manifesting in anger? Because without consciously doing that, we might miss the connection. I mean, if I were to ask you all right now, who are you angry at? You might say, Pastor, I haven't even had a full cup of coffee yet. I'm not angry at anyone. I'm just angry that I'm not in bed, right? If I said, who is angry at you? Who have you seen 
have a hissy fit or go off or have an episode of anger that was way disproportionate to what happened, you might say, I'm sure it's happened, but at this moment I can't really recall it, and why would I want to anyway? But if I say to you, what have you lost? If we were to just make a, 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 a list out loud during this time of what we lost, we might begin to see the source of our anger. Now, I know we can all say, I know, like a million people died of COVID before we decided to have a war in Europe. You might say, that's obvious. I know people didn't have graduations, birthdays ca were canceled, graduations, weddings were canceled. Okay, we've lost a lot. But what else have we lost? I want you to think a little more deeply. Here's an example. The first time I tried to lead worship inside with us all together, I forgot the words of institution to bless the, the bread and wine. I know the words of institution. I've known them for 20 years. And it broke my heart that I could not remember it. And so what I had lost was my confidence. I lost the ability to easily come up here and to lead with good humor and confidence and grace, I felt stilted, nervous, anxious, even embarrassed. So I lost my ability to lead you as well as possible. If you look at the second and the third tiers of things we've lost, once you get past the obvious big ones. What have we lost? What have you lost? Anyone? Anyone? Nancy? Your sister and your cousin in the last six months. I'm so sorry. Yeah. The deaths during this time seem like they're just coming one right after the other. Someone else? Her sister and her cousin died in the last six months. Yeah. Yes, Helen. Yes, this feeling of disconnection, absolutely. We have lost that, what is it? That peaceful, easy feeling <laughs> of being able to weave in and out of one another's lives. Now it feels like there's, it's stunted. It's like there's speed bumps between us, right? Someone else, what have we lost? Second communion? You mean? You mean communion with the cup and the bread? Coffee hour. Of course that's what you were talking about, coffee hour. <laughs> In fact, it had nothing to do with me. <laughs> right, we've lost coffee hour. And so that makes leaving here feel so awkward, doesn't it? Incomplete, disrespectful even. Right? What have we lost? There it is. There's the big one, right? It's the singing, loss of singing together was so much bigger than I think any of us could even have imagined, right? Um, and singing alone isn't the same. There is some kind of mysterious bond the mystical, the holy even, when our voices intertwine with one another here, and there is no doubt that the end result is greater than any one of us singing alone. All right, community and hugs. Thank you from the people watching at home. Community and hugs are big because now we get to do this little awkward dance. Can I give you a hug? No, okay, didn't even ask, right? 
um, being able to sit around the table thinking, am I far enough from them? Are they fidgeting in their chair because they think I should back up? How long have we been here, right? It seems like nothing, nothing is easy. Nothing is easy. And then we, we kind of get mad at ourselves sometimes as we think about these losses because it feels whiny, right? When people, when babies and hospitals in Ukraine are getting bombed, and when families are looking at multiple chairs empty at the table, nobody wants to say, yeah, but I miss singing, and I miss hugs, and I miss the peaceful, easy feeling, except that's what our lives are made of. That's what our lives are made of. And all of these collective little losses make us feel like we've lost control. We have no power in this situation. And I'll tell you what, if there's anything that makes a person angry, it's when they think they have no control in any given situation. And so I would like to invite you, as we work through this in Lent, to consider this. I thought when we started this series, I would be preaching and telling you methods to grieve, things you could do to grieve, things you could do to get your emotions out of your body because we know, we know that if we do not allow them to come out in some way, they turn themselves on our physical body and make us sick. So choose. You can either <laughs> work with your grief and your emotions of getting it out or you can probably be sick. Now, does every sickness come from that? No. But it is true that repressed emotions will make us sick. It ha happens to people all the time. And so I would like to suggest to you good trees who produce good fruit, that in order to produce good fruit as well as possible, we each need to take an inventory of what we've lost, no matter how small, because when we do, we can be a little bit more careful about how that grief from the losses might turn into anger against someone who doesn't deserve it, who doesn't understand it, right? Now, how do you get your feelings out if all of this loss makes you angry, a face of grief, and you can't yell at anybody? <laughs> well, one thing I think of is you kind of can if the person understands what's happening. I mean, my friend who got picked up off his feet and shook, he might not have expected that very greeting, grief, or that very greeting, but I guarantee he and everyone else in that room knew exactly what was happening, right? So I think about the ways that I may have snapped at someone the ways that I might have personalized something that I heard, criticisms of the decisions that I have made or council has made or the COVID task force has made, um, uh, people just uh, voting with their feet and not showing up as we try to rebuild. And I try to think about it makes me angry, but why? And the reason why is because it's all about loss. It's all about people feeling like this isn't the same, we're not singing, I can't sit near you, there's no coffee hour, I haven't talked to the pastor in over a year. I hate those little wafers. It's about that, right? I'm sorry, did that, did that just fall out of my mouth? There you go. There you go, right? <laughs> and, then, and then when I get really, really mad because the last piece of bread is burned when it comes up from the toaster, and I didn't change the number on the toaster, okay? I had it where it would be barely toasted, and now I have this burnt piece of toast. Nala, you got something to say about this? <laughs> But you see, I might be able to make the connection. Why do we get so angry? It sounds like they're having a moment over here. 
<laughs> did you? <laughs> Moment of identity, yes. Um, and so when you realize that that is why you're so angry and you can make the link to loss, the anger doesn't have the same power over you. It rarely morphs, in, morphs into real rage. It doesn't last as long. It doesn't turn into this beast that you are absolutely sure your anger is righteous and necessary. And no, by the way, it doesn't have anything to do with the plague or the war or the lack of singing. Okay, maybe it does. As a reminder for the prayers today, the response is dynamic, so you will want to follow along. In stillness, let us hear your voice, God. Easy to say, but hard to do. The endless whirl and explosion of thoughts in our heads force their way to grab our attention. Then the pings from electronic devices clamor, listen to me! Life in all its forms, too, often seems like a spiral of demands, claims, pressures, and concerns. But we choose to be in your presence. Here we are, Creator God, 
You are our rock on which we stand. Still, the busyness of our minds, the doubts, the fears, the concerns and worries, so we can talk with you and hear your voice, recognizing your accent as Jesus did in his human life. Into the stillness, creator God, speak your words of wisdom and life. The invasion of Ukraine, in all its horror and suffering, has stripped away so much of the previously dominant superficiality of obsessions with things and stuff and self-focus. We give thanks for the generosity of those who offer their money, talents, hearts, and homes to refugees. Holy One, so many are trying creatively to find ways to help those in Ukraine and those fleeing the bombing and shelling of civilians, hospitals, and schools, while others return to Ukraine to defend it. So many other questions erupt. Why do we do this for Ukraine, but not those caught in similar conflicts elsewhere? and so many other countries currently fallen out of the media focus. Yet, you say you created all people out of love in your own image and saw that they were good. Loving God, forgive us for failing. Compassionate God, you hear the cries of all who suffer, wherever and whenever. We pray also for those who perpetrate the violence and suffering, including the president of Russia and those aiding and abetting him. We hold all up to your care and healing that they may be turned around in your light to be freed and transform to work for the healing of all creation. Christ, the ultimate wounded healer, hear and answer the cries of our hearts. We give thanks for signs of hope, care, and inventiveness, whether reported or unseen, but giving life and succor to those in times of hopelessness, fear, and vulnerability. We pray for those experiencing racism, even while trying to flee to save their lives. Jesus, who walked this way as a man, In your loving kindness, help us to realign our lives to fulfill your will for who we are and what we do. Help us make new relationships with people, structures, and all creation in line with your justice and transforming love. We pray too for those being treated for cancer Stephanie, Heather, Lisa, Lauren, Brandon, Karen, and Dieter. For those who mourn, including the family and friends of Brent Colser and Karen Hacker. For all of our teachers and administrators that they will not grow weary from doing good. Claire, Chase, Katie, Al, Naya, Janelle, Carolyn, Tammy, Heidi, Linda, Jorg, and Molly. 
For all those in this community who work in hospitals and clinics, Deb, Justin, Jill, Andrea, Cliff, Sarah, Marie, Thomas, Heidi, Madison, Mariah, Doug, Jenny, Scott, Derek. For those serving in the military, Ian, Bethany, and Julia. And for those we now name, either aloud or silently. As we listen for your prompts, moment by moment, teach us to recognize your accent, just like Jesus. Amen. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you all. While we, while we greet one another with a word or a sign of peace, I invite you to place your offering in this one offering plate. If you have a hard time getting to it and raise your hand or ask a neighbor, I'm sure they'll take it up. I've also put out the, uh, by the door our little EFT uh, wooden coins that we all put in uh, to show that we give online. Um, or you, or you, can text your offering to 883-950-1405. And this time is kind of awkward, right? Some of us want to hug, some of us don't ever want to hug, and technically we're not hugging. So I have listed for you a whole bunch of ways that you can greet one another here, and I invite you to pick one and have fun. But before we do that, I do want to point the last one out. Kevin, Kevin, can you just stand up for a second? Kevin's going to des designate or demonstrate what does an all good head nod look like? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, I've seen you do an all good head, head nod before. Yes, you do. <laughs> All right, so let's take a moment now to offer one another a sign of peace.
Just FYI for anyone, this might be troubling, okay, me. These candles, it, they're not lit. Sometimes they act up. I think it's an act of rebellion because they're <laughs> mad that we haven't been using them every week myself. But, so we don't have these, but we have some candles over here. And Lord have mercy, we have each other. Let us pray. God, our provider, you have not fed us with bread alone but with words of grace and life. Bless us in these your gifts, which we receive from your bounty, through Jesus Christ. God of all people, all places, all hope, we come before you today and remember that during times of trial, times of war, you did not abandon us, but wept with the grieving, raged with the righteous, and whispered healing into the very souls of the weary and the war-torn. In times of bloodshed, through your servants, you bound the wounds of the stricken guiding nations to provide for those whose homes were destroyed and whose homelands were turned into battlefields. When Moses guided those once enslaved to the land you promised, a land where they could build, rebuild their lives, you accompanied them 
offering blessed assurance in the form of water from a rock and manna that fell like rain. In every age, soldiers have defended the persecuted and fought for freedom, trusting in your abiding forgiveness for acts they never intended and mercies never expected. The cry of the people who suffer from war, droughts, famines, and plagues, the cry of those trying to make sense of the senseless, senseless creates an achingly dissonant chorus of both loss and life. And yet, we also remember that it was in a time as violent and angry as this that your son came to live among us, bringing good news for all people, breaking bread with the empty and ashamed, enabling the disabled to walk and the blind to see, and welcoming the lost and lonely at your table. Before you were given up to death, a death so grisly even those who you loved you looked away. You took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to your 12 disciples, including Judas, who conspired against you saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, you took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you. It is shed for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And for centuries to come, we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, remembering your promise. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And today, as nations rise against nation and faithful believers the world over wonder if the end is near, we hold fast to the hope that came through your death and resurrection that there will come a day when all the earth shall be set free from violence, bloodshed, fear, and death. Come, Lord Jesus, and let God's people say amen. amen. Send your Holy Spirit to the broken hearts of all who share this bread and cup blessing each one with strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, that we might recommit to pursue love and justice in all the world. Come, Holy Spirit of peace, and let God's people say, may it be so. May it be so. Join our prayers and praise with your prophets, martyrs, and peacemakers of every age, that claiming the hope of the resurrection, we might live in the promises of Jesus. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, everlasting God, now and forever. Amen. As you take your communion as it's brought around, please hold on to it and we will commune together after everyone has one. As we commune together, we're all going to do it right. So the so the uh, great this is grape juice and a gluten-free wafer, and your grape juice should be at the bottom. And we're going to peel this off the top and take this delicious body of Christ given for you, and then flip it over. Take the seal off the wine or the grape juice. blood of Christ shed for you.
please be seated. And as we, uh, as the empties are collected, we'll sing Lamb of God. God, sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Okay, a couple of announcements here. Um, Stu, who has been graciously ushering and hiding from me. <laughs> He's, I think you, do you still need someone to count with you, Stu? Uh, no, I don't. I'm you, coming back next. All right, great. You got somebody to count with you. That's great. Do we have any other announcements for the good of the order today? Anything? It is snowing. It's so snowing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Please stand. And receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you sweet peace. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, let's sing. <laughs>
Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.